Uh, thank you, Hollywood Professional Association. Uh, can I have my first, ah, there we go. Unfortunately, I can't read it from here, so let me go over here. The United States of America is the host for hundreds of indigenous sovereign tribes that existed before the gleam of Cristobal Colon reached Reina Isabella, Queen Isabella's eyes. The Navajo Nation, shown here, enacted a treaty with the United States in 1868 that resolved a long and bloody conflict of cultures. That treaty closed the western frontier of the United States. The Navajo are the most populous of Indian tribes. 332,000 people declared as Navajo in the 2010 census. 170, about half of that, live in the res. Navajos are 10% of the Indian and native population <coughs> of the United States, which themselves total just about 1% of the US population. Oh, I have a clicker I should probably get. Okay. Now as I figure out how to use it. Okay, this is uh, Probably the best slide to show so is the situation. The Navajo Nation is that big purple blob there. Notice the unique configuration of the Hopi Reservation. And that was probably a little bit more difficult to manage back in the days when uh, there were no cars and roads. You can see the Four Corners area of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. Four of those corners are Navajo. And so the Navajo are surrounded by, and they're amid the peoples and cultures decimated by them, starting in the ninth century. The Navajo Nation covers about 270,000, 27,000 square miles. And you can see down here, there's three discontinuous portions of the Navajo Reservation. The Navajo Nation is comprised of 110 municipal chapters each with a town hall called the Chapter House, from which an elected chapter president and staff provide local services. Oops, two, got two periods there. The urbanized, are of Navajo chap the urbanized area of Navajo chapters is shown in this map. And uh, I'd also like to point out that those 110 communities, about 80 of them, the chapter houses are already wired with fiber. There's about 44,000 route miles of fiber on the Navajo Reservation, thanks to the Obama administration. So this is selected radio frequency digital transmission characteristics. You can see you have a yellow area, which I call the strong enough signal area. You have the central area, the stronger signal. And you have this area that nobody ever likes to talk about, the interference area. This is how the interference area works. You have in the black channel on a particular cha channel, RF channel, you have another one on the left that's trying to come in. These are low-powered TV stations, so they have interference protection rules, not sp specific distances. So the yep, new station coming in can accept interference from the other station, but without that station's permission, it can't create interference to that station. This is the age old problem of multipath. When you have two or more paths between transmitter and receiver. You can see here we have a direct path. You have a slightly, slightly diminished. You have another one that goes farther and then comes back. Mountains, particularly with rocky or granitic facets, are, provide a little ground cover, cause multipath. Long distances between transmitter and receiver, irregular terrain, buildings, bodies of waters, cars, buses, mass transit, planes. And there is mass transit on the Navajo Reservation, just not as mass as most of us are familiar with. Ionospheric upper altitude reflection and seasonable atmospheric ducting can also cause multiplath. It can be varied by receiver, location, channel, time of day. I think it might vary by political affiliation. Here's an example of severe multipath. Just happened to be captured at my house using a DECTEC uh, RF probe. You can see here at the zero reference, it goes all the way to the top, and then right next to it, 
400 microseconds delayed. Oh, thanks. I just needed to know where they were. Well, I can see it. I just really quickly want to go over this. You can see you have two traces 400 microseconds apart. That, any, no receiver would be able to make use of that. That's why I can't get that particular channel at home. So this is a single frequency network configuration using the same graphics as before. You can see you have uh, three channels. They're not only not only are the transmitters on the same channel, but they have GPS time reference, and then use synchronization technologies. There are several available to be able. So those transmitters all operate as one transmitter. Single frequency networks help solve, maybe eliminate a multipath, depending on the situation. These are the telecommunications options on the Navajo Nation. There's no cable television service. There was, I'm told, analog cable in the 1980s. There's no consumer-facing wired broadband aside from telco-provided DSL, but remember all that fiber to all those communities. Direct TV and DISH network provide satellite direct to home. And they have spotty, overstated, probably fraudulently overstated, 3G and 4G wireless cell phone coverage. And the question is, how many of those homes on the Nambo Reservation, there's about 52,000, have TV sets if there's no TV? Now, we hear, we hear talking about white areas. Here's the Nambo Reservation. You can see Albuquerque to the right. You see uh, Flagstaff to the left, these big round circles. This is a, quote, existing broadcast coverage, but it uses um, technology, it uses a method called signal contours, which actually, in, in heavily terrained areas, overstate coverage because signal contour method assumes that RF signals can travel through mountains. So I'm doing, so what uh, the Navajo, so about a year ago, the Navajo Nation asked me to come up with a plan to cover the Navajo Reservation with all their TV. They finally asked me to do this. And so these are, you're gonna see a couple three or four coverage maps based on prototype, prototypical facilities. Now, we're, when we're building these in the near future, Merrill Weiss will be doing all the RF work, so all of this will be redone because I've only done it, I only went through this four or five times, so I may have made a mistake. So this is one transmitter site, Navajo Mountain, a little bit over 10,000 feet. It's just over the border into uh, Utah. That's one LPTV transmitter, 15 kilowatts. Some of those signals are 100 miles away from the transmitter site. Predicted coverage, I might add. Then here's New Mexico, Days of Bluff. This is an existing Navajo transmitter site for their existing but currently off the air DTV facilities that I helped put on the air. This covers basically all of the Navajo Reservation from one in New Mexico, with the exception of those discontinuous areas, uh, from one transmitter site. This is the Arizona sites. You have eight sites I'm pro proposing in uh, Arizona. These are all low power TV, and uh, they provide 100% coverage of the Navajo Reservation. So let me go through that a little bit. You can see you have red dots. There's a couple blue dots. Those are just microwave relay points. All of these are existing uh, two-way radio or whatever transmitter sites on the Navajo Reservation that are operated by the Navajo Reservation, Navajo tribe, excuse me. Uh, over in the lower right-hand corner, you can see I've got microwave paths to those three discontinuous areas. They're kind of complicated to deal with. Not only are they far away from the rest of the reservation, 100 miles is the closest one, but the one on the right here where it says Toha Gili, and no, I don't know how to pronounce Navajo, um, that one gets plenty of TV from Albuquerque, but all the other ones get essentially no over-the-air television. So we could also say that the 20th century never came to the Navajo reservation. And for the Navajos to meet the 20th century, they have to leave. 
So 10 transmitter sites, that provides greater than 96% coverage. Now you can see the little voids there. Best I can tell, all of those void areas that are big are mountain ridges that are higher than the transmitter sites I'm proposing to use. And I don't think it makes sense to transmit to goats, uh, which is mostly what's up there. So uh, this should be available online uh, at any time. So the next step, once I figured out that the first step when you try to put a TV station on the air is transmitter sites. And you have to go talk to landlords. If your customer is the landlord, it makes that a little bit easier. Uh, and especially if you use their existing transmitter sites. So the next step was, okay, we can cover the entire reservation theoretically. How in the heck, what are we gonna use? What's the next criteria? And the next criteria I figured out was how many programs can you put into a transport stream? 19.39 megabits is used here, what I call ATSC-1. And you can see over the years from 1997, 1999, you could get Am I saying one there? And big two. Anyway, the point is that over time, we've gotten to a point now with HEVC compression, you can probably do 11 HD signals, as long as you're not doing a whole lot of basketball or football, uh, and one transport stream. But, is, but the problem, of course, is that Navajo want to do things in a standardized fashion. So you have to have a, you have a standardized codec. Well, what? How do you get that to people? So I spent some time looking at the various approaches to do a single frequency network uh, and these various technologies. I'll ignore the first three and ended up with ATSC 3.0 for the practical reason that it supports HEVC compression, it supports single frequency networks dealing with it, and it seems to uh, meet all their requirements. These are the advantages that I see for the Navajo Nation. Extensive, ATSC 3.0 provides an extensive, flexible system of digital broadcasting and wireless broadband. There's many standardized tools and features to assist in managing multiplath. It has a dedicated return channel because those areas that are showing on that map, basically, they don't have much of any uh, over the air. They don't have wireless internet to speak of, and it's provided by a commercial provider. Uh, so why does uh, so? Also, I have to say, I'm a consultant. I can't. Well, I have a very arrogant client. They determine on their own what they're going to do, and uh, so I just figured two-way two-way internet was probably a good idea to add. Uh, actually, it was suggested by a friend. I like the software-defined radio approach means that we're not locked into a modulation system. Uh, and by the way, did I mention that the Navajo Treaty is older than the FCC? So there's an argument that maybe the FCC uh, can't really tell the Navajo Nation what to do. So uh, provide home media devices. And did you see that part about TV sets? Yeah, we're going to make TV sets on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, wide color gamut. All that stuff you guys have been talking about and saying it needs to get to consumers. Well, I've been waiting a year for any announcement about people making TV sets. So we'll make it at the... Uh, to Diné uh, uh, Fab on the reservation that my colleague Roger uh, Atkinson clued me in on. And yes, I, uh, well, I could go on a little bit here, but internet protocol base layers, lower interconnection cost. I almost want to say blah, blah, blah. So we're talking about Navajo manufactured, not TV sets so much as home media devices. I can tell you they'll be modular. They'll, be, they'll based, be based on standards, have a high Wi-Fi hotspot in there, and a whole bunch of stuff. But go on. So this is part of this, the transmissions we're going to be doing. will be rebroadcast of other uh, stations beyond in the border zones. Border towns are basically the cities that surround the Navajo Reservation. And so we pick up signals off the air and uh, using technology that we ha I haven't coded yet. We'll have some kind of a dynamic lip sync fix that can be manually adjusted from a central facility and then take the ATSC 1.0 signal, convert it at the edge to HEVC, and we'll stream it directly 
to homes directly from there using IP multicast. And also, we won't be transmitting channels that people aren't watching. Uh, so this is the basic network topology. Uh, you can see you've got transmitter sites, you've got the relay sites. Unfortunately, they're a different color because I did them months ago than the other. And you've got window rock, the control room. I'm not sure that the control room is going to be there. I kind of like the idea of putting it over Preston Mesa and the Western Reservation. I should mention these, the triangles are existing FM stations. Some of them broadcast in Navajo, some of them broadcast country music in Navajo. And some of them brought the one on the at Preston Mesa, which is actually Tuba City, uh, is an NPR affiliate. Also, the Navajo have their own time zone. Apparently, the only person who really knows much about that is Brooks Harris. Uh, and so the first step, after you have a transmitter site, you need to hire a designer, right? And an architecture architect. So this is Tamara Begay of AIA. And she has all those other letters and Nash. She's got all the qualifications we need. I, I could say I found her over the internet. I did, but when I looked up she, her website, by the way, the website is much more sophisticated now than it was when I looked at it a year ago, it mentioned that she had done the uh, master plan for Crown Point Community College. And I had seen it from the air, and I really admired the look of it from the air. So she got hired only after she giggled for the second time in our initial phone call. So cost. There we go. Uh, principal and gap filler transmitters, less than eight million bucks. Headquarters and uh, network operations center, about four million. Uh, education, production, and training courses and facilities at existing community colleges, about six million dollars. Two Dene Industries improvements, uh, about two million. Now that's unfortunately that's before. I realized we we're going to have to make TV sets, so that will probably have to be about $8 million, $10 million. Uh, And uh, Media Hub and the other devices, actually, maybe those figures do, do, do work together. And then uh, the big news here is that I'm proposing that they purchase or acquire existing licensed full-service TV, commercial TV stations in the Phoenix, Albuquerque, Salt Lake City, and Southern Colorado TV markets. And then they'll use the must-carry rights that those stations have and pay 5000 bucks to create a corporation called Indian Country TV that will become the first Indian-operated broadcast TV network in the U.S. And this shows you kind of the footprint of Indian tribes in the U.S. from the 19, 2010 census. Percentage of population, you can see that you've got a big cluster there in the Four Corners area, Navajo principally, but not exclusively. And uh, you have, uh, uh, obviously, Oklahoma and along the northern tier, Alaska and Hawaii are significant uh, Indian populations. So Indian Country TV will reach at launch 100% uh, of the homes on the Navajo Reservation, more than 35% of all off-reservation Navajo homes, more than 40% of the population on Indian reservations and Alaska Native areas in the U.S., in about 20% of all Indian Alaska Native homes in the U.S. on reservation or off. Notice that part here. This is the big part here. Through commercial arrangements and partnerships with other indigenous tribes on the mainland of Hawaii and Alaska, the network's content providers and service put footprint can be extended. That's beyond basically my ambit. That, would, that requires negotiations that I believe or have occurred begun. Uh, Indian, all the Indian tribes in the U.S. meet every May. It's called the Gathering of Nations in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they meet there because that's the closest place to the main, the biggest tribe, the Navajo. <clears throat> so I'm talking about proposed business arrangements on the reservation itself. The technical facilities, uh, previously technical facilities were owned by the Navajo Nation Office of Broadcast Services, which is actually the Navajo Film Office, and uh, it was a very, very dirty and corrupt place that Hollywood helped pay for. And they helped finance that corruption. So the technical facilities are going to go to the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, which also provides electrical, water, police, governmental radio. Cultural and language programming will be produced on oh, education and training in production and operation by the Navajo Education Division 
and the on-reservation community and technical colleges. And then management operations, production, sales, and marketing will be contracted to Four Corners Broadcasting, a for-profit Navajo-controlled tribal entity to be formed under Delaware law. That's a big deal. So what is the Navajo Nation's broadcasting model? Well, we have, so let's look at comparative ones that we see in the world. We have state-owned and state-controlled. You can see the examples of some of those. We have public service, BBC, CBC, IPN in Mexico. We have commercial. They're independently funded of the state. Uh, they have operate generally in environments of free, with freedom of expression. NBC is a good example, uh, TBS Tech of Mexico. And then we have non-commercial, which is really mostly just the US, but Mexico has adopted it as well. And so PBS fits into that. And so the Navajo Nation owns and operates both non-commercial and commercial radio stations already. So I came up with, well, what's their model? I call it citizens service broadcasting. State-funded technical facilities operated by employees and volunteers provide citizens with many services and views with the Navajo Nation having limited opportunities to influence programming. Because the Navajo Nation is sovereign, they don't have a First Amendment, they don't have any of that stuff. And so getting to the point where there is actual freedom of expression on the reservation is important. And uh, leveraging the sovereign advantages and domestic subsidized at tax-free federal state haven status of the Navajo Nation is very important. Uh, when I work on the Navajo Nation, work for them, my, they take my taxes out of my pay because they're sovereign, but there's no reporting to state or federal because none is, no, they don't have any relationship with the state or federal government. All Navajos, all Indians in the U.S., thanks to the 14th Amendment, are U.S. citizens, but they don't have the rights of U.S. citizens on the reservation. The most important thing here is they have the right to contract with ability to resolve contractual disputes quickly and efficiently in an independent legal forum. They don't have that. Their courts are not independent. Uh, I guess to avoid being brutally frank, I'm not gonna say any more on that. Um, so what's the next step? Well, 10 years ago, I talked to uh, uh, Professor Tom Hazlett, which was, who was then at uh, George Mason University, and uh, he agreed that uh, if the Navajo ever needed to come up with a patent office or an innovation economy, he, was, he would uh, serve as consultant on that. And so I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, if there's any questions, I could probably answer a few. And I don't, nobody here did show up from the Navajo Nation, but I kind of expected that as a possibility. So yes, Antonio. Well, thank you, John. As, uh Really, a different presentation than we've heard. Um, I guess what I, my question to you: What is it you want our group to take away from this meeting, this presentation? Uh, well, that uh, the Navajo have decided that digital television with ATSC 3.0 has gotten to the point where it meets the Navajo's requirements, and. Instead of waiting for consumer electronics companies to finish the creation of this as an actual service, Navajo Nation is going to probably do it themselves. Oh, by the way, that budget, it was approved. <laughs>